Good evening. It is December 3rd, 2023. It's Sunday night. It's almost 9 p.m. on the East Coast, and there is a lot to get to tonight. Uh, there's a lot. First of all, let's start with this. Gold futures. Uh, at one point, the February futures contract reached 21.52. That's up $60 an ounce um, overnight, just the Sunday night futures trading. Uh, we're talking about going from 20.91 to 21.52. Now, since then, you can see these four red 30 minute candles were back down to 2107. So well off the session high, but this was really something that this move up here between six and 7 PM, uh, the first hour of futures trading. As I tweeted, it's a lot happening on the Twitter reverse tonight, the X verse, a lot of emotions, a lot of people unhappy with this move in gold because they've been wrong about it. And then some, de some people definitely cheering it on. Um, I'm definitely happy about it. Definitely more happy than I am sad, but I also am uh, completely aware that this sort of move, 60 bucks in a few minutes, is not exactly healthy market ac action and more characteristic of a short squeeze. So some shorts capitulating and covering. Um, and this sort of emotional outburst, call it, you know, market participants are getting very emotional. It's getting heated, but also the market, the price action is getting emotional. It's, it's, it's like an emotional outburst on the chart, the $60 move in a few minutes, right? Um, this can often mark, uh, you know, short term peaks, just like if gold gapped down and dropped $60 on a Sunday night, which we've seen before, we've seen that in the last few years, a couple of times, um, that can also often mark a short term or a major bottom. So I'm not surprised to see gold pulling back off that 2152 spike high. Um, let's see if it can consolidate around 2100. Um, yeah, you know, let's see. Certainly if, if, we, if we break back down through the previous all time high, that 2089, that would technically be bearish, right? That, that would be a key reversal and, and offer the potential of a failed breakout. But it's, it's way too early to talk about that. But this is a dangerous market here. Um, I'm not exactly trying to trade gold futures right now. Um, it's pretty volatile. Not for amateurs uh, that's for sure so so let's go through my bullet points try to be as concise as possible the the overarching theme really is this continued moderation in inflation we continue to see inflation prints like core pce last week <clears throat> we're down to about a 2.5 percent annual rate you can see this uh, year over year uh, CPI, 3.2%. Clearly, the trend is strongly lower, and we're getting very close to uh, the Fed's target range, 2 to 2.5%. Also, notice here that the one year ahead inflation expectations are higher than where we are today. So consensus still has it that inflation 
is not going to get back to the Fed's target range. This is just interesting to notice that because of what's happened in Fed fund Fed funds futures um, and in the Treasury yield curve in the last several weeks. Uh, we've seen a tremendous move lower in 10 year note yield about 80 basis points from 5% to 4.2%. And that's in one month, basically, that this move has happened. And it's no accident that gold has moved up very impressively since early October as yields have fallen sharply. There's obviously a very, very strong correlation there. Um, we are entering a data heavy week. So we have jolts on Tuesday, the ISM services, new orders and prices paid. Those will be important data points. And then the big, the big one obviously is non-farm payrolls report on Friday morning. The consensus is for plus 180,000. I'm surprised that the consensus is that high. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw something out there. Don't don't uh, hold me to it <laughs> too much, but a lot can happen too between now and Friday morning in terms of my opinion and, and in terms of market action. But I, I, I'm thinking that we're gonna be a sub 150 print here on Friday with revisions to the previous months to um, September and October. I would I would be betting on a November payrolls under 150,000. And I wouldn't be surprised if the unemployment rate actually printed 4%, 4.0%. 4, uh, 4 I'm surprised that, that the consensus has it so strong. I, I will throw this out there. Precious metals would be at risk of a correction or at least a big down day if the non-farm payrolls comes in above consensus. So like if we got a plus 200K print or, or better than that, I, I think you definitely see a, a down $30, $40 an ounce day in gold uh, on, on Friday. But I believe that the number will be less than consensus. Um, and I'm actually surprised it's, it's that high. Um, M2 is a leading indicator of inflation and the declining M2 growth, the money supply, the M2 implies that we are gonna to continue to see more disinflation. Uh, M2 has fallen to negative growth as it did after World War II. Therefore, the disinflationary trend will continue and this is the chart that uh, they showed. So here's your, your PC inflation index currently 3%, but look at the M2 currently negative 3.3%. And this is a very strong correlation. And this is just, you know, intuitively it makes sense. When the money supply expands, inflation prices across the economy go up. When, when money supply contracts, inflation falls or we even get no change in prices across the economy or we might even get deflation if the money supply contracts too much so right now we are with the feds tightening fed funds up to 5.5 percent continuing to trim their balance sheet quantitative tightening there has been a significant amount of tightening since early 2022 and clearly that is showing up in inflation data. So we're already getting very close to the Fed's target area. And according to this correlation, uh, the trend will continue. So inflation will continue to fall and maybe even by January or February of next year, it, you know, that core PCE might even be lower than 2.5% and the Fed will be at its, its target range. And that is why there has been a significant move in Fed funds futures in the last couple of weeks. Last week was quite notable. 
the Fed funds futures are now pricing in about a 65% chance of a 25 basis point rate cut in March 2024. So four months from now, we're going to get the first rate cut. And I think that has a lot to do with the big move up we've seen in gold in the last couple of weeks and even in things like Bitcoin. Bitcoin's above 40,000, folks. Is, is anybody paying attention to this move in Bitcoin? I feel like the, that the Bitcoin bear of 2022 and 2023 or the crypto bear said better um, has washed so many out of this market that I, I, I don't even notice much fanfare about this move above 40,000 in Bitcoin tells me that this could have uh, further to go. I mean, this looks like a real bull market. The, the Bitcoin bull is back. Um, but yeah, this is a big move in expectations of Fed easing in 2024. So now first cut expected to be March and five rate cuts in 2024, five. So we're gonna be back to four and a quarter percent by year in 2024, according to market expectations right now. That's a big pulling forward of easing. And that has been priced into the yield curve. So this move in the 10 year is pricing in those five rate cuts in, in, in 2024. So a lot of easing has been pulled, pulled forward by the market. I wonder if there's some room for disappointment there, either if the data isn't as weak as hoped or just the Fed says, no, we're not ready to, you know, we're not ready to cut in March. Um, but Powell very clearly and many other Fed speakers, data dependent, they are focused on the data. So if the data continues to soften and the inflation prints continue to come lower, um, then that March cut could be the real deal. It could actually um, prove the market could prove to be right about that. Um, yeah, so here's the gold futures you see continuing to pull back. So just some, some levels here. So somebody asked me for some levels in gold. So, you know, now that we've hit 2150 on the February contract, that's clearly the, the new all time high. I would say, you know, there, there's got to be some minor support in the 2090 areas, sort of near that previous all time high. Uh, but then I, I wouldn't say there is a substantial support level until about 2020. Um, you know, seriously, there's just not a lot of price memory up here. Gold has not spent a lot of time near 2080, 2090. Okay. So there's just not a lot of price memory. I, I would say 2020 is definitely a big level of support now. And then I would see, say down around 1980 would be the next level. Um, but you can see, so this daily chart, you can just see like, we are, we're clearly overbought. Um, and this move in the futures makes it even more overbought. We're going to get a golden cross tomorrow. So that means the 50 day is going to be above the 200 day. And all that's telling us is it's confirming the uptrend. Gold is in an uptrend. Well, duh, it's in an uptrend. It just made a new all time high. Just confirming that uptrend. Um, yeah. Bitcoin, okay, we talked about that. Yes, I, I think this move could have further uh, further to run in Bitcoin uh, for, for sure. But when I'm saying that, I'm also not saying I would just chase it on the fifth day up in a row uh, or after, you know, it's moved up $3,000 in a straight line in the last week, right? But I'm just saying that the context of this move and the strength of it tells me that it is for real and Bitcoin is definitely in a bull market again. Um, 
turning to equity. Oh, silver. So yeah, the, this four hour um, chart of silver futures. So that's a shooting star, quite obviously. And this has also been a very big move in silver from 22 to 26 in a couple of weeks and three weeks, definitely a very big move. A little bit of a shooting star there, similar to what we're seeing in gold futures. Um, a pullback, you know, like after a crazy move in the first hour of futures trading. In terms of the equities market, the stock market, uh, th this has also had a very big move in the last um, you know month or so. And traders, investors are very bullish. Um, they're the most bold up they've been in a very long time. And we're basically two and a half to one bulls to bears. So bears under 20%. That would give me a little bit of pause. There's just not much skepticism here. Uh, a lot of people are, are, are pretty bold up here. And we're seeing that in a lot of sentiment surveys. So that's just the one I chose. But there's a lot of sentiment surveys that'll tell you the same thing. Um, but, you know, I look across various charts, look at high yield corporate bonds breaking out financials you know look at this move in financials incredibly incredibly strong and now transports you know recall it was just a month or so ago that transports looked awful and they were the basically the worst sector in the entire market well look at what transports have done since the end of october uh tremendous november for the iyt transport sector um, ETF in November. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, look at this candlestick it printed in November. So basically from, you know, 216 closing up around 245 and now trading up to 251 here in the month of December, the first trading day of the month, but a very big move up in the transports in November and a great start to the new month for IYT up 2.8% on Friday is basically the best sector of the entire um, stock market on Friday. So we're seeing a sector rotation. You know, we are seeing uh, a healthy, bull market sort of sector rotation in equities. Um, the laggards are now oil and gas. Um, you can see crude oil has traded back down to 74 from a September high of 95. So probably one of the big factors in the, the bullish month of November for the transport sector is the poor performance in crude oil and natural gas. And obviously you're getting a bit of a rotation out of the oil names like Chevron or Exxon and into airlines, cruise lines, rails, you know, what have you, transport stocks. Um, but just looking across all the sectors is bullish. I mean, this absolutely looks like bull market action in stocks. And, and frankly, I, I would welcome a consolidation here for a few days in the S&P, uh, the QQQ, NASDAQ 100. There's definitely, we're seeing some rotation out of these mega cap tech names and sprinkling that money into, into financials, transport, even biotech, healthcare sector rotation. You know, this is, you know, this is what a bull market looks like. So as, as, as much as many people want to just call the top, you know, this is, this is a crazy move. It's moved way too high. You know, people are too bullish here. The, the bearish uh, sentiment is under 20%. It's got to be a top. I, that's just not enough. You, you know, this is a very, uh, strong market and I don't see enough evidence to 
make me want to try to call a top here. I'd much rather just play the trend uh, and, and, and buy on little consolidations or pullbacks. Moving to more granular, um, oh, look, I, I was starting to put gold miner charts and then I, um, <laughs> I didn't finish it. But first, let's get to Simon. So those who watch these videos on a pretty uh, regular basis know that I am a follower, a commentator on the medical psychedelic sector. I also write about biotech. That's another sector that did well in November, uh, well off of its low in October. Um, but specifically, Cybin. So we talked about this last week. We talked about the R&D briefing, the, the webinar that they had on Thursday morning. And we also knew we we're going to get news. So this is uh, an article that I wrote on for Friday morning about Cybin and about the top line data from CYB003. So this is again, proprietary psilocybin analog for the treatment of depression, something that is a big deal, big problem today, right? Anxiety and depression. Uh, some real mental health ailments that are uh, afflicting um, a lot of people, millions of people across the world today. So MDD is what this, this phase two trial was focused on. And look at the data here. So a second dose... 12 milligram dose of CYB003 gets 79% of patients to remission with Mater scores under 10. That's impressive. That's very impressive. So the response rate of a second dose and the rate of remission, both 79% um, for a second 12 milligram dose of CYB003. So in my mind, this data is spectacular and safety and tolerability profile is definitely favorable with no serious adverse events at either 12 milligram or 16 milligram doses. And so the stage is now set uh, for Cybin to submit the data to the FDA and request an end of phase two meeting. Uh, and that'll probably be happen happening in Q1 and then on to phase three. Um, so we expect to get more data uh, in, in Q1 from this phase two study, and then the commencement of you know recruiting for the phase three study will start in Q1. So spectacular. Um, I'm, I'm happy with everything about Cybin. Company is cashed up, uh, plenty of cash, to move into phase three. And they also have another $34 million of warrants priced at 51 cents that they could tap into next year. And we're gonna get more data um, from CYB004 and another drug uh, in phase one trial. So we're gonna get that also by the end of the year. And just simply, if the FDA greenlights Simon to phase three uh, for CYB003 and MDD, I think that's a that's a major milestone and it, it sets the stage for a re-rating um, for the company. Okay, so you know, closed on Friday at 46 a sh 46 cents a share. I think the market cap is somewhere around like 180 million dollars currently. 
I, I think it could be higher. I think it, it could be a lot higher, um, quite frankly. Um, I'm long. I bought more last week, but I, I was very pleased with this uh, data that came out last week. And I see a bright future ahead for Cybin. And, and this could absolutely be a stock that could perf that could perform well here in the final weeks of 2023 as funds get positioned for 2024. So that's Cybin. And we talked about the huge move in gold. So the gold miners, so it's interesting. Uh, we got breakouts all over the place. You know, this chart of AEM, you see the volume just pouring in here, force index off the charts. This is a very powerful breakout uh from a head and shoulders bottom pattern that that formed between august and november so you have a multi-month bottoming pattern put in place against the backdrop of completely washed out capitulation level sentiment among investors in the gold mining sector and now we're getting a powerful breakout on volume Hello, it's happening. It's happening, guys. Uh, it really is. And then Barron's jumps in here uh, on Friday, publishing an article saying, don't buy the metal. So don't buy gold, buy gold miners instead. And specifically, they talk about Newmont, which is just funny. I think they, they do that just because it's the only one in the S&P 500. It's the biggest market cap. And so it's just the safest way for them to play it. But look at Newmont, you know, yeah, it was up another 2.5% on Friday, but it's had a big rip in November. So we're talking about from 33 to uh, 41, you know, that's a big, that's a big move for Newmont, you know, like a $50 billion market cap company that, that uh, that's a pretty uh, sizable move. I wouldn't go chasing it immediately after Barron says to buy it, especially as it tests runs into the 200 day moving average for the first time in quite a while. Okay. Yeah. Since, since the summer, uh, and just look to the left, look to the left on the chart. 41 was previous support. So now it's back testing previous support, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just go ahead and chase this move in Newmont because Barron's says to, but I do think we have to acknowledge the strength in the sector across the board and the um, weight of this bottom that was put in place. So many skeptics did not think this would complete the pattern that gold miners would move up to the levels where they're trading at as of Friday. So many people hating on this sector, washed out sentiment, and yet now we're getting very bullish price action on volume. So I would not ignore this sector here, okay? I think, yeah, I'm not gonna go chasing the sixth or seventh day up in a row in some of these stocks. But this is a sector that we could get some consolidation. We could get a little pullback for a week or two, reset, and then we could zoom up in the final weeks of the year and into 2024. I, I would not want to be trying to fade this move up in the gold mining sector. I think that we put in a major, major low in this sector in early October. And I've been consistent on that for the last several weeks. And you can just see some of these moves. I mean, look at Core, look at Alamos, Agnico, and even Newmont. Like, it's literally like the worst gold mining company the last couple of years. And even it has moved up uh, 30% or almost 30% off of its low from early November. 
Um, let's see. Yeah, Barons, we talked about that. And now the juniors. So this, this is a week where I'm going to focus more on the juniors, and I'll make another video uh, focused on my tax loss, tax loss shopping list, which would just be all juniors. Um, but we're seeing signs that maybe tax loss silly season came early this year. So it might have happened already in November. Um, so just throw out a few names where I think they've probably seen the lows. Banyan Gold. So I, I think this one um, put in a low, um, I mean, even last week. Okay, so I think that this is it for Banyan. I think 26 cents. Uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty comfortable in saying that that is probably your your 2023 low in Banyan, 26 cents. And it's it's interesting to know that the day that it traded this huge volume, which you can see here, so that was last Tuesday, it traded uh almost 2 million shares that day, you can see from CEO.ca, there was a big block trade, 500,000 shares that took place around one in the afternoon on that day. And then look at what it has done since then. Now, obviously, you know, the sector, the gold mining sector did, uh, did well at the end of last week, gold did well at the end of last week. So that also helped, but it just, it felt like in Banyan, there was a big seller that got cleaned out there uh, last week and the offers, you know, lifted then and the stock moved up. So from 26 cents, it traded 33 on Friday, closed at 31 and a half. So that's an example of a capitulation washout in a junior. Here's another one. This is another one I own. Ridgeline Minerals, RDG. Uh, look at the year that, you know, RDG had, it started promising in January. It had this big move up on good results. They had good results. The company had really good results and it traded up as it should have, but then it got smacked right back down and it's been drifting lower for all of 2023. So, you know, it came into the year about 24 cents a share. Well, recently it traded as low as 10 cents down more than 50% year to date. And it just, it felt like it's just getting absolutely washed out there at 10 cents. Like I, I just couldn't imagine who is left to sell this stock. And I choose this one, but there's many examples of juniors in similar situations, just felt like a capitulation washout. And look at what it did on Friday, up 23.8% on pretty healthy volume. So another example of a washed out junior. And then Western Exploration, WEX on the venture. So this is another one that's been drifting lower for many months throughout 2023. It looked like, just look at the volume here, some of these, these bars at the end of November, looked like it got capitulation um, sell-off there early last week. And these hammer candlesticks, so these long tails here on Monday and Tuesday, and then look, it, it really rose nicely into the end of the week, closing at 70 cents. So those are just three that are on my radar, but there's plenty of other examples. It feels like the junior mining sector put in a major low in November. The tax loss silly season may have already kind of reached its climax. And hopefully we can have a good finish to the year um, in the sector. Definitely feels like a lot of stocks have uh, had their capitulation climaxes to the downside. So sort of final topic, I don't think there's any, 
Oh, and it, yeah, I, I did want to mention this. I knew I had a reason why I put this article up. So it was just um, not even two weeks ago that I published this article. And yeah, November 23rd, it feels like yesterday. And I also mentioned this sort of analog to summer 2019 um, on the KE report on the Daily Gold podcast um, and then in this article. And I felt, I said, I felt like gold is shaping up for a similar sort of breakout to the one we saw in June of 2019. Well, gold was 1992, the day I wrote this article, it traded 2152 tonight. So a $160 an ounce move in less than two weeks. So sometimes you get it so right that you surprise yourself with how right you are in your analysis. And this would be one of those times. So it feels like it is playing out now. But now we have to try to make sure maybe we're not getting too much of a good thing too soon in too short a period of time. You know, one of those too far, too fast moves. But I also want to really point out that this is a monthly chart. So the, the summer 2019 move was from like 1275 to 1550 in about three and a half months, right? So, you know, just doing uh, some of the math in my head, that's a little bit more than 20%. Okay. So what's 20% on 1992 80 an ounce, right? So we're talking about 2400 somewhere maybe a little above 2400 would be a similar sort of move and remember this was just less than two weeks ago that i made this point so if it happens similarly to 2019 well maybe gold gets to 2400 by march of next year so just to put it into perspective that's the sort of move that I would be looking for if things fall into place. Okay. I'm not looking for 2,400 by the end of this month. Okay. I think that would be a too far, too fast sort of move. So I'm actually, again, I'm happy to see gold consolidate around 2,100. I don't think we want to see, uh, you know, $60 per ounce moves in 30 minutes. That is, that is, sort of frantic and highly emotional sort of short squeeze type of action, not healthy bull market action. Um, and then the final topic. Yeah. And again, I'm making the point that in the near the daily chart, gold is pretty overbought here. So some consolidation uh, would be in order. Um, final topic, Hercules silver, Bitcoin looks great guys, but let's get rid of some of these charts, healthy sector rotation. Oh, I did put up this range resource chart because I believe this is one that I want to be a buyer of. So this is another example where you have rising moving averages. So the longer term trend is lower left to upper right. The sector, the oil and gas sector has had a correction in November, but this is the sort of correction that I'm a buyer of here. So I like RRC, if we get a further dip down to about 31, uh, I mean, even 32, so maybe, yeah, we're, we're almost there. 31 to $32 a share. I like range resources. This is a natural gas producer and I am bullish on natural gas for 2024. And it's, it's gotten hit pretty good in recent weeks. It's setting up for um, a bottom 
probably in early 2024, so January, February. I, I might be a little bit early here in RRC, and that's why I don't own it. I'm just pointing it out, putting it on your radar. But final topic, of course, we've got to end with Hercules Silver. So a few things I want to I wanna make note of here. Um, here's the weekly chart. So it had that tremendous seven week run higher from 20 cents to 162. Uh, now we've had two red weeks in a row. We had one where it was down about 12% and then last week down a measly 2%. So completely normal after that uh, 700% rise in seven to eight weeks that we're getting a little bit of a pullback. And actually last week, so let's, so this is the weekly chart. Also notice the volume is, is ticking lower. So we've had a couple of much lighter volume weeks. So we've had two down weeks on lighter volume. And again, this is to be expected in a drill play, you know, new discovery story as we await the next set of assays, okay? As investors uh, wait for news, people get impatient, take profits and sell. So it's totally natural that we had a couple of down weeks, small down weeks on light or lighter volume. But now look at the daily chart. It's always important to look at a stock on multiple time frames, not a single time frame. So look at weekly, maybe even monthly, daily, even hourly. Um, so this is the daily chart. And I want to point out that last week, so on Tuesday and Wednesday, it came back down to test the 110 level. And why is the 110 level of any significance? Well, because that's the price that Barrick Gold paid to get uh, nearly 10% stake in the company, right? They, they, they put 23.4 million Canadian dollars in the company at $1.10 a share, right? Um, and then they, they bought some warrants from, you know, like another counterparty. And then they had bought some on the open market and added it all up. And, um, you know, you got a 15% stake in the company right now. And then they have the option to take it up to 19.9%. But $1.10 was the price that they cut the big check at check at so clearly that's an important level and that's turned into support so people were willing to step in and buy at that level and sellers dried up a bit at that level so now 110 is clearly a support level and also i didn't draw the fibonacci but if you draw the fibonacci you know, retracement from the beginning of this move in early October to the 162 November high, the 38.2% retracement is at $1.09. So, so that's what I would call a confluence, okay? You've got multiple different factors pointing to a price level. So that's what we call confluence. And sure enough, that 110 level proved to be support. So I remember a couple of weeks ago, I told you I took profits, sold some shares when it got up of a 400 million market cap. Well, last week I added some back at 110, 110 and 111. So I was a buyer there on Tuesday and Wednesday. And I feel I feel pretty confident that we're going to get a news update from the company this week. Again, I don't know that. I've said it before too, and I was wrong, but it's just, it seems like it's time. And I would not be surprised. And actually I'm expecting that we'll get multiple pieces of news from Hercules Silver between now and year end. We could also get uh, the 3D IP. I think that could be a separate 
piece of news all by itself. And then we definitely have assays pending for a number of holes. Um, seven of the deeper holes still pending assays. So I think we're going to hear uh, from Hercules more regularly here in the final month of 2023. And you can see they haven't updated this presentation since they did it in early November. So maybe we'll get another update to the presentation here, maybe even including some of the, the, the big new 3D IP data. So yeah, I was a buyer of Hercules last week and I like the fact that the technicals, the oscillators have reset. So remember, they got really overbought, really overheated uh, in mid-November. Well, look, price basically has gone sideways for most of November. And now these technical oscillators, these momentum indicators have cooled off the relative strength index on the daily moved back to the median line, which was which is where you would expect it to start to move up again in a bull market, right? So if the stock or whatever market you're charting is in a strong uptrend in a bull market trend, you would expect right around that 50 level, it starts to turn up again. And now, uh, we're completely reset for the potential of a next leg higher that might take it to new highs. Potential. Um, the 110 level is definitely now a support level. I would say the $1 level, not just because it's a round number, but it's proven to be uh, support on a number of occasions in early November. And then obviously we have that gap fill at 93 cents. So remember that that was the day that the Barrick private placement, the financing was announced and it gapped up from a close at 93 cents. So that would be an open gap. So open gap at 93, psychological key support level at $1, Barrick financing price at 110. So those are three levels of support that are underneath us. And then key resistance at 150 on a closing basis, and then the 162 all time high. And then above 162, it would be blue sky. Um, so please do your own due diligence. This is not investment advice. I hope that you found some value in this video, maybe learned something. And if you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel at Goldfinger Capital. Um, follow me on Twitter at CEO Technician on CEO.ca at Goldfinger. And I think there's a lot to be grateful for, especially at this time of the year. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to make these videos um, and to be able to trade these markets. Um, so thanks again for your time. And I hope you have a powerful trading week.